yourself. <laughs> Nina Varela. It's me, hello. So if you've been on my Twitter, Instagram, like anything in the past like two months, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that I am obsessed with her book. And I'm Nina, fan. thank you for acknowledging <laughs> that. Nina has very graciously agreed to stay with me in the poll after her San Francisco event to chat about this book because I have a lot to say about it. Kali Ray and Nadi are behind the camera stalking me to put me under some more pressure. So with that, we're just gonna get started with the interview. To start off, give us your best prior score pitch. Ooh, okay. It's about a world in which androids have taken over and have subjugated all the humans. And the main plot is the forbidden romance between the android princess and her human handmaiden. And also, in there, there's a revolution where the humans are uprising against the androids. Pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, I've done no better at the elevator pitch, like, as long as I've been doing this, but... <laughs> Hopefully that's good. So, obviously, you're a big fan of music. You made playlists for, like, all of your main characters. And then I went and spent, like, two hours making a playlist for the book. It was so for good. Fun. It was Thank perfect. you. I put a lot of thought into it. I, like, structured each song in a specific order to, like, correspond with the events of the book at the time. I appreciate that. This book has helped me a lot in procrastination. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they wrote an essay. I did. In I did. I'm so excited to read it. A I did. already. Because you love music and I love music, can you choose one song to represent the book and then one song to represent Cryer and Ayla? Ooh. One song to represent the book. I'm trying to choose a different one every time. <laughs> so I think for this this one it's going to be Yellow Flicker Beat by Lord. Ooh, that's a good song. Yeah. And then Cryer is going to be I Wish I Was the Moon by Nico Case. And Ayla is Raise Hell by Dorothy. That's good. Making the playlist was so hard because I was like, I can't put any of the songs you've put on the playlist on it. I know. So I was like, I need I to find new one. songs. I had yeah. to like stop myself from having like at least five Janelle Monae songs on <laughs> yeah. each one. But like, sapphic yeah. androids, like she corners the market. And this wasn't like originally a question on my thing, but then you were talking about Harry Potter in there. <laughs> so can you sort Cryer, Ayla, Benji, and Queen Jun into Hogwarts houses. Yes. Ayla is a Slither Puff. Cryer is a Griffin Claw. That's just their dynamic. <laughs> Benji is a Hufflepuff. Yes. And Queen Jun, I feel like it's like obvious that she would be a Slytherin, but she is a Slytherin because she's so cunning and ambitious, ready to take on all the adults. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. a Slytherin, and you can tell that Queen Jen and I we are the same Slytherin. person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You could easily be the bone eater. Exactly. <laughs> the bad queen. Right. That's how all my friends talk about me. Yeah. yeah. Also, because you mentioned being an astrology gay. Oh, yeah. Do Cryer and Ayla have birthdays? And if so, what are their signs? I don't know their birthdays, but their signs are Ayla is an Aries sun. Okay. And then I think it was like Scorpio rising. Yeah. And then, I don't know, her moon. I forget what it was. Maybe Aquarius moon, to be honest. Maybe. And then Cryer is a Leo sun, and I believe maybe Pisces moon, and I think her rising is maybe, oh, Virgo rising, I think it was. Yeah. And now onto the questions I actually wrote down. Okay. How different is the final published version of Cryer's War from your very first draft, and are there any, like, big non-spoilery changes that were made that you can share just for fun? Yeah. Like, the first draft and the final draft are not super different. At that point, most of the changes were superficial. It was more like the first outline to the first okay. draft, like everything changed. Because originally, like, the androids were much more futuristic. They were called, like, enhancements. During the process, I kind of realized that I didn't want to go the futuristic way. I wanted to make it, like, feel more lush and timeless, like a fairy tale, which is how, like, the alchemy magic came along. So that was, like, the big change. And then from, like, the first draft to the final draft, I took out, like, an entire entire 50 page sequence or more even where they broke into like a fortress yeah we went full on ice fortress whatever that was called in six of crows and they yeah like broke in and like ayla just dis disguised herself as an automa i don't even know what happened i think they were like following keenock they basically like just wreaked havoc in this like automa kind of convention thing it did not add anything to the plot obviously so i had to take out like 50 or 60 pages of that i feel like you did talk about this a little bit during the event but all these people weren't there so give us a little insight into your world building process. For me, it always begins with location. I get really obsessed with certain places visually. I'm writing a middle grade right now that's set in Appalachia because I got really obsessed with like the Blue Ridge Mountains and I get obsessed with the Texas desert or like recently the Pembrokeshire 
coastal path in Wales because I was reading this book about it. Yeah, the world originally came from the idea of like this castle right on the edge of the cliff or of like these black rocks and like the freezing ocean. And then I started thinking about how the Ottomite would look and what I wanted that world to look like in terms of the civilization and the kinds of things that they believe in and the kinds of stories they tell each other. And so that's where like a lot of the world building during the actual writing process came from is like wanting to make it feel like a fairy tale but then also wanting the characters to tell each other stories and to have you know things that they believe in and I had to figure out what that looks like in this specific world what would that look like what would they need to believe in what would they be scared of and a lot of it just came from like that very emotional place. Benji is Ayla's best friend mm -hmm. in the book and I'm a Benji rights activist <laughs> That's my protest movement. It's for <laughs> Benji's rights. So give us some tea on him. His character goes to a place in book two that I don't know if a lot of people are expecting, but I think that seeds were planted during okay. book one and I'll see what people think. I'm gonna um, read the book and like look for the seeds. <laughs> He's a very sweet boy. He's a good boy. Yeah, he is just very like idealist, just like fiery rebel boy who is, you know, willing to put his life on the line for what he believes in and in book two he grows up a lot like they all do but he he really grows up a lot and becomes a little bit less soft but not in a bad way that's the tea do you know at this point how the story is ultimately going to end yeah i've written book two i always knew what the eventual ending would look like yeah and there was just like a matter of especially in book two just writing toward it i kind of like reverse engineer it like i know what the ending needs to be and then i have to figure out what has to happen in order to make that happen. So yeah, the ending, I really like it. I hope that it is what people need it to be. But yeah, I had a lot of fun writing it. It came out the way I wanted it to. Okay. So I hope you like it. <laughs> So you like kind of talked about this in there and you were like, people ask me all these deep philosophical questions, but I'm just like gay and I just wanted to write about girls. Regardless, I'm going to ask you a deep philosophical okay. question. Okay. So a lot of this novel really focuses on that idea of what it means to be human. No. First of all, why did you choose that theme? And to make it even harder, what do you think it means to oh, be human? Yep, here it is. I should have known that this was going to happen. <laughs> I chose to write about that, again, because like, the character of Kyra was the first that I just sort of knew who she was. And so like the question of, you know, what does it mean to be human is very natural when you're dealing with androids. Obviously you can go like the, oh, like they're not homo sapiens route, but that's not fun. So I wanted to have this, you know, race that looks exactly like humans and, you know, they think like humans. If you have something that looks and speaks and acts essentially exactly like a human, except for a few differences, then why are they not? That question came like very naturally and organically as I was kind of developing this. Now I'll answer it. <laughs> I don't think it's emotion as much as like, you know, prior having emotions, especially for Ayla is like a lot of what makes her open her eyes and kind of take off like the veil of privilege and realize how harmful this system that she benefits from is. I don't think it's emotion. I think a lot of people say like, love is what makes us human or like compassion is what makes us human. I don't think so. I think everyone's brain is different and we all experience things in different ways. I think a lot of it is telling stories. I think it is a very uniquely human urge to want to tell and share and remember stories. That's one of the first markers we have of like what we think of as the modern human. We have like the cave paintings and like the carved animals and that's how we know, oh, these creatures were humans as opposed to whatever else. We've always been the same. We've always had this urge. It's in every culture. I think it is in every person. I think that it is telling stories. I think that that's a lot of it. That's part of why I focus so much on that in the book. The stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world, especially like the confusing, scary parts that we don't know how to deal with otherwise. I think that's it. So That's basically what you're saying is that the book community is more human than anyone else? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, like stories are what make us empathize with people and understand people, even if they're like super different from us. Stories are how we humanize ourselves to each other. And also book people are more human than everyone else. <laughs> Not to get too political, because I don't want to like inadvertently politicize your book. <laughs> I haven't like talked about this before for that reason. To me, this is a book about colonization. Yeah. The disparity between the Otome and human it's represented in humans from the beginning of history till now. How much of that was intention or how much of that was like you trying to build fantasy and the real world was like no? I think 
a lot the second one because I'm not the person to write mm -hmm. the colonization book. You know, that's not the story that I should be the perspective on. A lot of it was just, you know, coming up with this world in which obviously one type of person is the dominant culture, I guess. Even though it's a fantasy, like, it comes from me. I live in reality on Earth. The stories that I've heard and, like, the history that I've learned obviously have bled into the book. A lot of that was just, even in this fantasy world, the dominant culture would act like this. Essentially, like, appropriate human culture into their own civilization and, like, you know, cherry pick what they like best and leave out whatever parts they don't care about, which are often the human parts. It's kind of, as you said, like, I didn't set out to write mm -hmm. the colonization book. You know, it's not, like, a racism allegory. Because, yeah. again, I'm not the person to write that. But it is just, like, it's impossible for reality to not bleed through. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that the humans are kind of the quote-unquote, like, marginalized because that forces all readers to empathize because all readers are humans. Yeah. Unless, like, my dog is reading the book, which I don't think he is because he's pretty dumb. But, yeah, I think it's interesting because then we're forced to empathize with this group and kind of look inward at ourselves and yeah, maybe yeah, our yeah. own privilege in that case. Yeah. So now I'm shifting more into questions about you as the author mm -hmm. to get some tea on you. <laughs> Do you see yourself more in Cryer or in Ayla? My current self in Cryer, my past self in Ayla. Yeah, I was like a very angry teenager and like I didn't even have a good reason. I was just miserable and like dramatic in the way that I think it's very natural for a teenager to be. I think that's like a very beautiful thing about being a teenager is having so much emotion. I was like 12 years old in my room listening to Star and Roll by Marina oh. and the Diamonds oh, yeah. thinking that like yeah. I had faced the worst of the worst. Oh yeah. Yeah, like listening <laughs> to Paramore in the dark like thinking, you know, this boy doesn't like me and that's the most pain that anyone has ever felt. <laughs> like I love that. I have so much love and respect for teenagers. People are not as empathetic or kind to them as they should be. And that's what I'm writing for. I'm writing for teenagers, especially queer teens, but all of them. So Ayla, again, was like my love letter to like the angry, dramatic teenage girl. And then Cryer, who is also immature, obviously, in a ton of ways. She's super naive. She's well-intentioned, but often is so naive that her intentions turn out bad. She's much more me now in the fact that like I'm less inherently angry more situationally angry i want things to be better i would love to destroy the system love that i'm very like kind of calm and nerdy these days not quite as like furious as i used to be all the time so there's a little bit of me in both of them see like i was yeah. always like i see myself in ayla but then i went and wrote an essay about crier's war and that's completely a crier move yeah reacting <laughs> to things by writing essays yeah. is very <laughs> crier. i know the answer to this but i'm gonna ask it anyway just for fun. Do you see yourself always including a queer and Sapphic narrative in your work? Oh yeah. Can you talk about why that is? As Hailey Kiyoko said, <laughs> I'm gay, so it's gay. I wrote this in an interview the other day. I didn't mean it to come out so dramatic, <laughs> but I was like, I don't have it in me to write straight <laughs> stories. I'm not strong enough. I think the straights have plenty of people writing stories for them. I'm gonna write for the queers, especially the, the sapphics. That's just like what I want to see more of and what I love reading and the people that I want to write stories about are just like, you know, young lesbians messing stuff up. Same. Um, that's me right now. In bad ways. And that's awesome. Like, that's what <laughs> yeah. I want to write about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting because you talk in there about how you wrote your straight romances back in the day. You know, growing up, all my characters were white and straight. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm writing like queer brown characters, yeah. I feel like I'm just naturally a better writer because it's yeah. more organic and authentic. Oh yeah, when I was like writing this straight romances, for some reason, it always felt like a little bit forced. <laughs> like I don't want to invalidate my past self. Like I did have feelings for boys. I identified as bisexual for a long time. I, I don't really anymore, but that was real at the time. Mm -hmm. But still, queers love differently, and I was not writing that kind of story. I always felt like there was like the pane of glass between me and those stories, and I was mm -hmm. just sort of writing what I thought I was supposed to write instead yes. of what I really wanted to write. And so as I grew older, I like, kind of realized I was queer, and then, you know, started wanting to write more about love stories between girls. That's when it started feeling closer to my heart and like really coming from my heart. There's so much more me in this. First of all, I want to make a disclaimer that no author who's marginalized or who writes about marginalized characters is obligated to like make that their brand or like talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Something I've noticed is that, especially like in this event today, you don't try to lessen the queerness. You are very upfront about the story being gay, about how you want to see more queer stories. You don't try to like 
appease other people to make it seem more appealing and I can really appreciate that. Yeah. I make a point to say the word lesbian as often as I can, which, you know, has gotten me unsavory reactions from people. The reactions that you might expect. I think it's important to use those words. If I'm okay talking about them like that, not everyone is and that's absolutely valid and understandable, but I am and so I'm going to. It's good to just be vocal about it if you're able to and be open if you're able to and you feel safe doing that. Like especially using the word lesbian, which mm -hmm. has a lot of connotations yes. as like inherently dirty or like mm -hmm. pornographic and stuff. Yep. Not to get too deep out here on Friday night <laughs> in San Francisco, but a lot of times I think about the reason why I took so long to identify with the word lesbian is because of all those connotations. Yeah. No, okay. So I think that hearing people who are comfortable, like you said, talking about it in that way paves the way for, you know, like teenagers who you write for to experiment with different terms in a more accurate way and see what actually fits them. Yeah, exactly. You never have to have anything figured out. If you change labels a billion yeah. times, that's valid. It's good to just have those words and take away any, you know, negative connotations and to like just talk about the truth of them and, you know, write stories about the truth of them. And that's what I, that's what I want to do. What's something that your readers might not know about you that might surprise them? Oh my gosh, um, I'm an open book. You are, you're just like walking and you're like, I was crying in a coffee shop <laughs> yesterday. I'm a Pisces, I cry all the time. <laughs> I cried earlier today, I forget why. <laughs> oh, I think it was because like I saw a video on Twitter of a soft dad. My big weakness is like gentle dads. My friends always send me every single video and I do cry every single time. There was that one that went around a few months ago of like, it was like dad and talkative baby. And they had a whole conversation and the baby is like responding. And then they did like a Denny's ad and I cried over that too. I cry all the time. That's my fun fact about me. I'm a Pisces moon, so I get it. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, you're moon. Yeah. I don't know. I mean it's in my it's in my bio, but like I'm from the south. I grew up like big old red state, which is part of the reason why it took me a while to realize I was queer. I'm very lucky my parents are accepting. I like knew queer adult couples growing up. The queer couples that I knew were like like a butch lesbian couple in their 50s. And that was the only thing I knew that lesbians were. And I didn't like personally identify that. I didn't know that there could be like infinite different kinds of queer that you can be. That's another thing that I'm loving seeing all these queer books is because it shows you like the infinite ways in which you can be queer and that there's no one way there's no one label and anything you are is completely valid so yeah so they're not bringing so if you could collaborate with any author on a future book which author would you choose oh well, there's so many i mean like obviously like oh, leave or do go like, call me leave <laughs> i really love tara sim's writing style i think that would be such a fun collaboration i want to do like a contemporary at some point i think that'd be really fun like i'm definitely fantasy for now but any of the fun contemporary writers yeah, like Mason Beaver. That, that would be the fun. most iconic collaboration of all time. When Tara mentioned, I wish you all the best in there, like I physically responded. And they're from North Carolina too. We could do like a whole... Um, Mason, call Nina. Yeah, like literally anyone I would be so happy to work with. I want to keep writing books. Kind of on that note, this is a question I ask all the authors, hopefully, that are on my channel, unless I forget. What advice would you give to aspiring writers, especially aspiring marginalized writers? It's not impossible. I feel really kind of glib saying like, keep going, like you can do it. It's yeah. true that there are a lot more obstacles for queer writers, for queer writers of color. It's not unreasonable to think that the doors are closed for you because oftentimes they are, but it is not impossible. More and more writers are being published each day and the door is getting wider and wider every day. Even if it's not this project, even if it's not your third project, like, your story is, you know, it is relatable. There is a market for it. Teens want to read it. Don't listen to people who tell you that that's not true. Don't listen to people who tell you that your story is not important. Like whatever you write is real and other people feel it too and your story is important. I just feel stupid saying don't give up because like it can be so hard. Like it can be really But I feel hard. like even hearing that message, especially yeah. for someone who's I mean, I don't want to say on the other side, because with each book, you have to kind of fight that battle again. But for someone who's made it through once, to even, like, 
hear that, it can at least give you like a little motivation, yeah. you know? I will say don't give up. It is not impossible and you should tell your story. And I have to ask this. Yeah. So Nina has this dog. I know you shouldn't like compare <laughs> dogs because they're all cute, but she is like by far like the top three cutest dogs I've ever seen. Oh yeah. So is she thriving and living her best life? She's thriving. She lives in the lap of luxury. We got her from someone who got her from a shelter. So I think like the first couple years of her mm -hmm. life were not great. And now I'm making up for it by making sure that she gets every single thing she could possibly Good. want. That's so what she deserves. Yeah, so she is okay. a horrible little monster who gets everything she wants. That's how it should be. Yeah. That's how it should be. Yeah. Those are all my questions, but I have a few other closing thoughts to okay. say. The book I'm currently working on with my very sad book writing series on my channel <laughs> that gets like an episode once a year. I haven't like talked about this here yet. I've talked about it with like my one friend, Adriana. Adriana! Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's like, they're like the main person I'm talking to right now. But yeah. I decided to turn my contemporary novel into a fantasy. Mm -hmm. The entire plot of it, it's 100% inspired by Cryer's War. 100%. The second thing, which is a huge claim, like anyone who's been on my channel for like any amount of time, my friends behind the camera can confirm. I don't say this a lot. So you all know I love Cassandra Clare. Fun fact, I love Cassandra Clare. Here's my Cassandra Clare tattoo. Aww. Exciting. I read those books in like 2012 for the first time and I've been consistently obsessed with them ever since. And I have not been as obsessed with the series as Cassandra Clare until I read Cryer's War. That has never happened to me. I've never written an essay about like a freaking book before or like made a playlist and like made like aesthetics for it. I have not done that in years. Like this literally took me back to when I was like 12 watching like fan videos of Cassandra Clare's books. Like I have not been as obsessed. So when I say this is in my top three books of all time, like I'm not joking. Like I dethroned Adam Silvera for you. I, I love you Adam Silvera. <laughs> I love you too. More happy than not still saved me in many ways. But like also lesbians. Sorry Adam, you don't write lesbians. <laughs> Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Maybe I'll collab with Adam Silvera. You should. I was hoping you would say Adam. <laughs> Adam's the one who introduced me to Nina. It was oh, like y'all. Was it y'all? Yeah. Yeah. He like came up to me and he was like, "Oh, you like gay stuff? Here's Nina." <laughs> That's literally what happened. I'm the gay stuff. When I say that, I don't say that lightly because you all know how much I love Cassandra Clare. Like nothing <laughs> holds a candle to it until I read Cryer's War. When I talk about this book, I'm not being flippant in my love for it. I'm very serious about it. Thanks. Thank you, Nina, for sitting with me in the cold San Francisco night. It was a pleasure. All the links to where you can follow Nina. She's very much a Twitter gay, so like, follow her on Twitter. I'm very online. There will be links to where you can purchase priors or in the description. If you can, you should do so or request it at your library. Thank you all for watching this mess of a video. <laughs> but all mine are. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all decide to follow Nina and stalk her. And that's all. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>